Okay. So now for something completely different. I think we all tend to focus on algorithms for our own data. But I think it's pretty rare that any of us actually is in the position, the luxury, of being able to say, I will only work with my data. In actual fact, we have to work with other people's data sets, and we have to work oftentimes with data sets that we're not completely familiar with. And we run into this basic problem. How to access, use, mine someone's complex, potentially huge, multivariates, you know, many different tendrils, many different dependencies data set. And so one of the things that we've tried to do in the PIGER project is actually develop uh, what we would hope to be, you know, the simplest possible solution for this general problem. And we call this world base. The idea is that this is sort of a virtual namespace for scientific data in which ideally we'd like to imagine that inside this importable namespace would just appear to be all of the world's scientific data. So the metaphor here is that we will just import this virtual namespace, and then inside this namespace there'll just appear to be all sorts of different biological data or other kinds of scientific data with some kind of hierarchical uh, namespace conventions. Ideally, this should work in such a way that the user just needs to know the name, nothing more. You just say the name, and magically the data materializes in a form that is fully usable, um, the complete data mining interface that you, the original uh, producer of the data had. So um, what this is storing is not the actual data. We would assume that if someone has a big data set, they've already got classes that can store that data on disk and access it, or access it from a database server or whatnot. But what we have instead is the issue of the metadata for saying, how is it that you access this data? What classes have to be used? What are the dependencies? What is the schema? And so on and so forth. So let's just jump into a simple example of this. Um, we start at Python. We import our namespace. And then we can use simple features like uh, Python's own DIR function to be able to search this. So we see a bio inside that. We see multiple sequence alignment and sequence information inside this namespace produced by a vendor called UC Santa Cruz. Oh, they've got a large set of, of data in there. We can ask for additional information by using a directory function that will take additional arguments, for example, asking for this information to be returned as a dictionary. So for one particular data set, I ask for some more details by asking for this as a dictionary. I can see exactly what I'm going to be getting. And now if I actually want to get the data, it's really just a matter of saying the name of the data set that I want as it appears within this namespace. And then I just add a constructor uh, syntax on that to actually tell it that I want to construct this. I did this from Stockholm in a hotel room, accessing data from uh, UCLA. This is uh, Python running on my laptop in my hotel room. So um, now we can start using this data. This is a simple example of simply pulling out uh, chromosome 1 of the human genome from a 17 vertebrate genome alignment. This is a data set that's probably maybe half a terabyte in size. And now um, we can ask for additional information for mapping, for example, I, what I'd like to be able to do is I'd like to be able to get the identifier back from any individual sequence object. So you can see this prover provides the reverse mapping. I give it the sequence object, it gives me back the original ID that finds that sequence. Now I start slicing this data. I take a little interval of chromosome 1 out of the 3 billion bases in the human genome. And now we just performed the query that's searching this comparative genomics 17 genome alignment. And now it'll start actually showing us some results. So what I'm going to do here is I'll get the source interval that's aligned to a destination interval in some other genome, and I'll ask also for edge information describing the nature of that alignment. So you can see that right away we can fully mine the data in all the different kinds of ways that scientists would be used to doing in this kind of a comparative genomics analysis. So I'll just print out the alignments, maybe I'll show one piece of sequence, 
its ID, aligned to another piece of sequence, its ID, and then maybe I'll give the level of sequence similarity between those. And of course, the standard Python operations of asking for a string from an object, mapping it, to, uh, in this case, to get its identifier, and um, the edge information provides methods for being able to get the identity. So um, now it's going and querying back to uh, the XML RPC services and getting us all of our alignments. Okay, so what this has had as an effect in, in my own experience, uh, even as the, the developer of this, I've been very surprised by, you know, how this changes your life. Typical example, you know, I had someone who was working on a project, and commonly in academia you have these situations where, you know, the instant a student graduates, it's like, you know, the project just dies, right, because nobody remembers how to use the data. So in this particular case, I was stuck in exactly that situation, and then I scratched my head, I remember, wait a second, didn't I tell him to put that data in uh, world base? So I then just started running searches. You can use regular expressions or whatever. And within uh, about 20 seconds or something, I, I found myself with all the data at my fingertips, and I was actually doing work. That's unprecedented in my previous experience as an academic, uh, to be able to use other people's data without basically pulling out all my hair. So... Um, how do you actually stuff data into this yourself? Well, it's a namespace. So you just assign into the namespace. That's it. So in this particular case, here I am creating a resource. This is, let's say, draft 17 of the human genome. I have to put, give it a doc string just so that uh, world base, when people search it, they'll have something to tell them what it is. And then we just assign into the namespace. That's it. And we commit. That's all that there is to it. It will... Um, detect any dependencies. If this piece of data has dependencies upon other pieces of data, they will also be saved. If those pieces of data are themselves uh, identified as um, particular identifiers within world base, they'll just be uh, saved as a reference to that name. And this is a mechanism that you can use both for capturing all of your own data that you're going to forget in the future how to use, and also as a mechanism for being able to save data to other people. Um, this operates through a mechanism that we call uh, metabases, in other words, a metadata database, which stores the type, schema, and access information about all of your different data sets. And um, when you start up, you simply provide a world-based path. It's just a list of metabases that you want it to use. So in this particular case, my home directory, my current directory, some uh, system directory, a MySQL database, and an XML RPC server in order. So obviously this is searched in order of precedence, so you can force local rules to take precedence over remote rules. Another kind of real usage example, I was working with a large data set of Exxon annotations just on my laptop, and I realized later on that what I was doing shouldn't have worked because I didn't have the right version of the genome for these Exxon annotations, but it worked anyway. Why did it work? It worked because it fell back automatically to the XML RPC service to get data that w didn't happen to be on my laptop. The idea of this whole system is that um, you should always have access to all data. It may not be efficient local access, but you should always have access to all data. We do this through XML RPC services, um, and it's quite straightforward to set up your own XML RPC uh, server, and we provide on uh, UCLA uh, servers about 200 different comparative genomics data sets, just as an example of serving large amounts of data. Now, um, frequently, of course, once you get a taste of this, you want it fully available in fast uh, local indexed data sets rather than accessing things from somewhere else. So all you do is you add a flag download equals two, true to that constructor for requesting a particular resource. And every, that resource and all of its dependencies will therefore automatically be downloaded and installed and immediately working um, completely automatically. You specify the location through the world base download environment variable for where you want those data to be installed. Another aspect of this is that it captures schema information. That is to say, the data sets, one of the crucial things about them is that they have relationships to other data sets, which you could express in the form of mappings. 
In other words, that I have a mapping that will map items of one data set onto some other data set. A classic example of that within my field of molecular biology are so-called splicing graphs. In other words, um, we have some entities called exons that are uh, connected to each other through uh, relationships called splices. And so a splice graph is simply a graph structure whose nodes are exons and whose edges connecting pairs of exons are splices. So if I had such a mapping, it was basically the splice graph that, that connects these data, I could save it into WorldBase, and furthermore, I would tell WorldBase the schema for this uh, mapping is that it is a many-to-many -many relation from a data set exons to a data set exons um, with edge information supplied by this uh, data set called splices. Furthermore, I could specify that I want this mapping to be automatically bound to any items from these individual data sets by specifying this bind adders argument. So what this will do is that whenever somebody happens to look at the next attribute of an item that comes from this exon's data set, that will automatically invoke the loading of this splice graph data set and then the mapping of this exon through to the exon target and splice edge information that connects it. Let's just look at what that uh, looks like in code. So let's just say I have an individual object called exon that was actually derived from that exon's data set that we, we obtained from WorldBase. All I have to do is just ask for its next attribute. And what this will automatically give me now is the exon target and the edge uh, splice that connects exon to exon 2. I can iterate over it or do whatever I want. So um, this is exactly equivalent to asking for exon.next as taking exon and using it as a key to splice graph, with the difference that the user doesn't even need to know that splice graph exists. Again, all they need to know is the name of the attribute. Just as in WorldBase in general, all you need to know is the name of the thing you want. WorldBase will automatically um, add this uh, descriptor onto the uh, Python class representing this exon's data set, and if the user actually touches that attribute, asks for it, it will automatically invoke going and actually getting the splice graph data set and using it to um, resolve this query at the moment that the user attempts that operation. Okay, so um, I think I'll just talk very, very quickly about the underlying foundations that made this whole kind of mindset straightforward to implement. And that is that... Um, in, in Pyger, which is sort of the foundation for WorldBase, we really treat all data as just two kinds of things. Data sets that essentially are containers, dict-like containers of individual items that all share the same schema. And secondly, mappings that map items from one data set onto another in the usual Pythonic way. And the only thing that we've really added on, on top of this is... Um, the idea that one-to-one -one mappings are not enough. We also need to support many-to-many -many mappings, and that's basically just a graph. And in Pyger, a graph interface just looks like this. Instead of being a single-level dictionary interface, it's basically a two-layer dictionary interface. So we have the graph shows an edge going from node 1 to node 2, and it also provides additional edge information associated with that edge. So um, this is a representation system that abstracts away from actual questions just of how are we going to store this data. That is the key to scalability, right? You don't make assumptions about what's actually going to be stored in memory. You instead create a representation of a particular kind of data that someone will want to work with such that, you know, someone can ask for, give me, you know, a 40 genome alignment on a computer where they would never have the memory to actually be able to load all that data into their computer works just fine. Why? Because we're representing these uh, individual intervals or relations without actually having to imply that that loads into memory all of those objects, right? So, of course, once you have a standard representation, um, 
you write multiple uh, backend implementations that are optimized for different patterns of scalability. The classic types of scalability that we address are really three. One, the in-memory representation, where you're actually storing data in, in memory for I.O. bounded calculations. On disk uh, indexing uh, storages, in which you're dealing with the memory bounded case, and we provide various kinds of backends that provide that. And then client server uh, implementations, in which, say, you have some kind of CPU bounded calculation on massive data sets that you wouldn't even be able to store on local disk. Piger provides all three of these kinds of backends for every kind of data type that it works with. I won't talk, I think, at all about the implementation of this kind of stuff. Just to say very quickly, um, the whole issue of persistence, which in world base we're really trying to, to address in a basic way. That is to say that, of course, there are many, many different ways to achieve persistence. I mean, you could just have a relational database and you do SQL to sit, write and read from that. You know, that achieves a, a persistence goal. However, um, we think it's useful to add kind of an extra criterion that we would call encapsulated persistence. The idea being the only thing you need to get access and, com and full interface to work with that data set is just its name within a namespace. Obviously, Python long ago provided um, the foundation for this basic capability, and I want to emphasize that I don't think that anything that requires more than just a string, right, as a name, um, will scale across large, complex um, data integration activities, basically because you can't automate it. Okay, so in the last few minutes, um, I want to address kind of a, a conversation that I think we should all be having, even as we sort of beaver away within our own narrow um, individual uh, data algorithm analysis activities, we still have to think about how we connect to each other's data sets. Basically, the problem of scalable data integration. And, um, you know, I, I think that what we need to do is actually have a conversation about the different pieces that make data integration scalable. And I have a hypothesis that I want to provoke you with as an idea for how to think about this problem. And that is that if you want to solve that problem, you really only need to think about one idea, which is how to turn the problem of data integration into just abstract graph operations. What do I mean by that? I mean that, you know, if you want to move a data set from, let's say, one computer over to some other computer, that literally all that you should have to do is just draw the graph representing that operation, okay? So I've got a node representing one machine, I've got a node representing another machine, I've got an edge representing, you know, going from one to the other. And the interesting thing about it is if you really force yourself to think in this sort of pure abstraction model, it, it implies many things that have to be automated. For example, we have to have a completely standardized way to convert any data set to or from a platform independent, in other words, portable form. Um, the actual code for this data set's standard interface must also come along automatically, uh, along with the data. The schema must also come along automatically with the data. The relations that it has to other data sets must work regardless of where all those other data sets actually are stored. And the management interface should actually just be as simple as drawing that picture. You draw the picture, it's executed, that's it. So um, a few scalability principles I'll just end with, which is um, that you know you can already pretty much connect all these things together if you have a namespace in which just knowing the name allows everything to cross-reference everything else. Um, you, of course, have always choices about uh, performance, but as long as those are made transparent, in other words, how you use the data doesn't change at all, no matter how which choice you make about the back end, and as long as those, those choices are explicit and trivial, you just say, I want that back end instead of that back end, you get what you want. Um, in the last, whatever, few seconds, I'll just say that 
I think there are many additional steps that we need to take this um, in terms of um, the transformations. So, you know, we can draw these graph structures not just for moving data from one computer to another. We can also draw transformations of data types as these kinds of graphs. And, you know, this is just like writing a set of make rules, right? So, at some level, within a system like WorldBase, we actually want to embed sort of the full logic of make. Um, I think I will just end right there, because there will actually be another talk um, immediately following that it will address some of the same uh, issues about uh, this project, Piger. Um, this is a consortium uh, of a number of different universities, um, and uh, we've released about uh, eight different versions over the last five years, hosted on Google Code and on GitHub, um, and funded by NSF, NIH, DOE, and also uh, Google Summer of Code. And I'll just end there. Python Graph Database Framework for Bioinformatics.